was the first night home for the holidays, and all through your town, not one thumb was quiet. A lot of swiping going down. You created the perfect Bumble profile with care, in hopes that your dream guy or gal may be out there. When what to your wandering eyes should appear, but a ton of faces you haven't seen in years. There's a rando from high school, your ex from eighth grade, a kid you used to babysit, and your literal Uncle Dave. As cringe as this feels, the only thing worse would be if one of them stumbled upon your profile first. But there's no need to panic or erase your face from the app. You can go incognito with one simple tap. Disappear from the others till you say they're a match and have more fun finding your next hometown catch. With peace of mind and your profile hidden from sight, happy holidating to all and to all a good night. Happy holidating with incognito mode from Bumble. Download today. The Presidency of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. As our regular listeners know, I'm occasionally joined by special guests to talk about their work in the field of history. Today's guest is David T. Beto, a research fellow at the Independent Institute and professor emeritus at the University of Alabama. He received his PhD in history at the University of Wisconsin and is the author of T.R.M. Howard, Doctor, Entrepreneur, and Civil Rights Pioneer, and From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State, Fraternal Societies and Social Services, 1890-1967. to He is also co-editor of The Voluntary City, Choice, Community, and Civil Society, and the forthcoming Rose Lane Says, Thoughts on Liberty and Equality, 1942-1945. to In our discussion, we spoke about David's recently published book, The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, the untold story of FDR's concentration camps, censorship, and mass surveillance. As the title suggests, there was a good deal to unpack in our talk, and it was such a pleasure to talk with David about his research and the new perspectives that he provides in his work about the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. I cannot thank David enough for his time and the insight that he shared in this episode. Without further ado, let's get to the discussion after this brief message. Twas the first night home for the holidays, and all through your town, not one thumb was quiet. A lot of swiping going down. You created the perfect Bumble profile with care, in hopes that your dream guy or gal may be out there. When what to your wandering eyes should appear, but a ton of faces you haven't seen in years. There's a rando from high school, your ex from 8th grade, a kid you used to babysit, and your literal Uncle Dave. As cringe as this feels, the only thing worse would be if one of them stumbled upon your profile first. But there's no need to panic or erase your face from the app. You can go incognito with one simple tap. Disappear from the others till you say they're a match, and have more fun finding your next hometown catch. With peace of mind and your profile hidden from sight, happy holidating to all and to all a good night. Happy holidating with incognito mode from Bumble. Download today. All right, David, thank you so much for being here, joining us today here on Presidencies. Thank you for uh, asking me to come. uh, I've uh, been very interested in a lot of your shows. A good friend of mine was on there, Kevin Gutzman. Yeah, we had a great conversation, and I know this one will be as well. For our listeners, the book is The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, The Untold Story of FDR's Concentration Camps, Censorship, and Mass Surveillance. And as the name suggests, David covers a great amount of ground in this book, and it's just an amazing read. I highly recommend after you listen to this conversation to pick it up because there's so much that we're not going to be able to talk about, but we're going to try and hit some highlights to give you a taste of what is in this book because it's an amazing, it really helped to reshape my thinking about the FDR administration. And I imagine that for our listeners that it would you as well. And so to get us started, David, I'd like to bring up something that you wrote towards the beginning of the book. Quote, Throughout his life, he, referring to FDR, repeatedly operated under the assumption that the desired end 
was far more important than the means used to achieve it. In his view, the protections of the Bill of Rights, while laudable in theory, took second place when they conflicted with policy goals considered more vital. So did your research provide you with any clues as to what contributing factors led him to arrive at this viewpoint? Well, I mean, I I didn't really do a, a deep psychological biography. However, I will say that that idea was consistent with a lot of the ideas that were gelling up in the period. FDR is born in the 1880s. That's a time when you're getting the rise of progressivism as a political philosophy, coming together from a number of different sources, um, including a lot of Americans who went to Germany to study and, and the social gospel and so forth. And there is a belief that you see really expressed very starkly by um, a progressive writer named Herbert Crowley, who, who talked about basically what we want are, we want Jeffersonian ants. As a, that's what a good society wants, which is justice, which is democracy, which is equality. All right, you can disagree with his interpretation, but that's what Crowley said. So let's use Hamiltonian means to establish Jeffersonian ends. Now, the way Crowley kind of couched it is Hamilton wasn't worried about things like constitutional precedent that much. He wasn't worried about those sorts of legalities, right? He wasn't burdened down by them. He would go to seek the goal. And I think that FTR sort of imbibes that to some extent. Now, you could say a lot of this is, you know, FDR is a very ambitious man. There's there's a lot of sort of interesting political calculation. He ran as a Democrat, though he could have easily run as a Republican. He was he was actually closer to the Republicans at the t- you know during the period before he ran for office, including his uh, illustrious cousin, who he called Uncle Ted, and very much patterned himself after Uncle Ted. I think self consciously. Well, and and it's interesting that you bring that up. You know, at, at this point, and I remember um, with the nineteen forty election and reading about that, and that there really wasn't much of a a policy difference between Wendell Wilkie, the Republican candidate, and President Roosevelt. You know, they the, their policy viewpoints were so close, and it seems like this was a time where folks really could go either way, except for some of the folks who were on more of the extremes, but that you had this moderate middle that, you know, could agree on so much. That's a very good point. And and I will say, you know, that has negative side, I guess, as well. But people got along a, across political boundaries, I think, a, lo, a lot better than they do now. You had someone like H.L. Mencken, who was, I don't know, almost an anarchist, but Mencken would just get along with everybody. Right. He had correspondence with everybody. And you'd see this over and over again. So I I think there's an argument to be made that people, at least in their personal relationships, were less constrained by ideology, didn't put themselves in boxes uh, as much as people do now. I don't want to. Yeah, I mean, I really think that's true. Just just looking at all of the correspondence, all the interconnections between people of really different political philosophies and how they would come together to cooperate or have dialogue uh, for particular causes. And, and that, that wasn't something that held them back. Well, and in particular, speaking of relationships, one of the key things that you come back to in your work is FDR's relationship with the legislative branch. Would you mind speaking to Roosevelt's relationship with administration supporters in Congress and how much or little influence he exerted in their efforts to push forward his agenda? And in particular, I was hoping that you could speak to the Black Committee's work, which you described as, quote, monitoring private communications on a scale previously unrivaled in U.S. history, at least in peacetime. Yeah, I look a lot at FDR's relationship with the kind of younger the younger congressional leaders who I think were, were really trying to move his agenda forward, that really believed in his agenda. You know, a lot of the more elderly people in Congress, and it was an elderly leadership by and large. I think I give the average age there was very high. But the younger sort of movers and shakers who really 
came up in the New Deal tradition. These older people came up in a different tradition. And one of these was Hugo Black, who was a senator from Alabama. In fact, the law school, I think, here is named after after him. And Black was uh, had not been in the Senate very long, but he was regarded as someone that was very effective, very zealous, very much an ally. Uh, Black's I think it was FDR's son once said that, uh, you know, if you wanted a job done, you'd give it to Black. And so what was happening about 1935 or so is that Roosevelt was feeling somewhat besieged. He came in in 33, everything, everyone was behind him, and there's growing criticism, and he's a little concerned about this. And so there is a movement that FDR supports uh, to investigate congressional lobbies which would be very broadly defined, any sort of anti-New Deal tendencies, right? And they want to do a congressional investigation. And so they end up choosing Black because let's have Black chair this thing because he's the guy that's going to, you know, he's going to dig it out, right? He's going to be very aggressive. So they do. And Black has some difficulty initially calling in these witnesses who kind of stonewall him and, you know, even get some public support, like, hey, you know, why are you, uh, you know, uh, violating my privacy and, you know, making it an argument that it's political. So Black has the idea that, look, what if I can get the private telegrams of witnesses I'm going to call? And it turns out there was a rule. All the telegraph companies, of course, the big one was uh, Western Union, had to keep on site uh, copies of private telegrams that were sent, incoming and outgoing. And these had been subpoenaed in the past in a couple of cases, but Black had a different idea. He wanted to get access to to all of them, basically. And so it goes to the FCC, and the FCC, of course, is cooperating with the administration. And uh, they go to the telegraph companies and say, Senator Black wants all telegrams for example, this is one thing he wanted, sent in and out of Washington over, I think it was a nine-month period, by every member of Congress. He wants to see those copies. And Western Union said no, you know, because, you know, that just wouldn't be good for business, right? But they're basically told, you, you better go along with this, and they do. So black, black staffers and... um people from the FCC go in and they start saying, okay, we want to see all telegrams by, you know, Senator Burton Wheeler, you know, for over this whole period, we want to see all these and all these income and outcoming. And they, they do it. And they end up expanding the search to more targeted people, such as a very controversial, a guy named Silas Strawn, who was a head of a prestigious Chicago law firm. It's still there called Winston and Strawn now, I think. And um, so they expand it. And guess what? They end up looking through thousands a day, and it adds up over time to something like 3 million telegrams. And when I saw it, I said, that's, that's, you know, that's got to be wrong. And then I did the math. I found a memo from one of Black's aides that said, here's how many we're going through. And what he what he told them was, what Black told them is, look, if you see something that's personal, that doesn't have to do with lobbying, just look past that and go on. So it's kind of pretty, pretty broad. So then you would bring people in and you could, you could just ambush them. It's like bringing somebody in, bringing your broad in and somebody pulls out an email you wrote to a friend, uh, you know, and you're very candid in your email and they can just, they just blindside because telegrams, this is an important point, were like the emails of their time. Right. It was 50 percent of long distance communication was telegrams. They were instantaneous, almost instantaneous. You often had telegram operators on site, particular businesses. And so they they were communication where you'd really let your hair down. You wouldn't save them generally. Right. Um, They and so forth. And so they would they would it was like it would be comparable today to looking at your to going through your emails, right? Mm-hmm. Essentially wholesale and then and, and doing that. And that's what they did and really blindsided a lot of these people. Now, it came out of a kind of a real scandal that was occurring where there were uh, 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 there were coordinated efforts uh, 
by uh, the utilities to send telegrams on a massive scale. And there was some fraud going on and things like that. But then Black rapidly expanded it to include people that had nothing to do with that particular scandal. And eventually word got out that he was doing this, partly because Western Union started to inform customers. And uh, one of them was Silas Strawn, who sued. Another guy was Newton Baker, who had been Wilson's secretary of war. And Baker said that, look, if I, I'm a peaceful man, and Baker was kind of a moderate type. Uh, but if I saw someone trying to lynch, a lynching party, putting, uh, putting the rope around uh, Hugo Black, I would not stop them. You know, and this is Newton Baker, who's not prone to, to do that kind of thing. So he found out his telegrams were searched. And there was a lot of outrage. This was headline news. And I, this was, I guess, anticipating, I think, one question you were going to ask me or you were thinking that you were interested in. One of the more surprising things that I found doing this research, that this is headline news all across the country. And I'd like never heard of this before. It was New York Times, Washington Post. It was on the front page of many newspapers. It was it was hot stuff in, you know, early 1936. Absolutely. And and that was one of the things that was surprising to me as well to read in your book about some of these scandals that I really hadn't heard of, but they are there in the newspapers. They were being discussed at the time. And it's just, it's really interesting to, to see that play out and to kind of bring some of that history back up. And especially, I mean, it, as I was reading about the black committee, it was just like, I was like you, I did this double take. I was like, this can't be, <laughs> this was massive. This was a massive scandal. Yeah, and you get groups like the American Civil Liberties Union. You get normally kind of establishment congressmen like, I remember him when I was young. I'm showing my age here. Emanuel Seller, um, who I think had just sort of retiring. I think Elizabeth Holtzman succeeded him. But he was like, oh, this guy's just a normal kind of Democratic politician. You get people like that saying, John McCormack, you know, who later became uh, Speaker. Uh, was he speaker? Yeah, he was. he was. Yeah. And you get people like that that are like, call, you know, comparing uh, black to Mussolini. It's like, whoa, you know, and that's that's an interesting difference with today that you get a civil liberties um, consciousness, I would say, or whatever you want to call it, that transcends people from both parties. And you have a real concern for civil liberties that um, people are saying, I don't agree with you, but hey, you know, you know, defend your civil liberties. You get more of that. You know, uh, Black, for example, tried to single out uh, William Randolph Hearst because one of his telegrams had been searched. And he thought that that would be, nobody likes Hearst, right? You know, at least on the left. And he thought that that would make him more popular. It actually backfired, where some of these people like Seller are saying, well, I don't like Hearst either, but he's got the same rights as you and me. So I don't know if you would see that kind of thing happen today in either party. I doubt you would. But there was a civil liberties, bill of rights consciousness, I guess you could say, that transcended political boundaries. Absolutely. Well, and, and it's interesting, you know, thinking about that time in comparison to the present day and thinking about this idea of media. You know, we talk more in the present about the influence that mass media has on politics and how politicians adapt themselves to the media. But it was fascinating in your book to read about the impacts that politicians and government officials had on existing media like newspapers, as well as the nascent media of radio. So David, would you mind elaborating on how the federal government's approach to media in the 1920s and 1930s shaped media into what we think of it nowadays? Well, it's interesting that in the early 1920s, I make an argument that radio was actually less, a more of a free, there was more free speech in radio in some ways than there was in the print press. You had no prior restraint laws, for example, for radio. Basically, the federal government's only role in radio was to essentially license stations and kind of police wavelengths. And that changed for some interesting reasons that I go into that were that were very complicated. 
But eventually you get the uh, the Federal Radio Commission coming in under Calvin Coolidge. And Coolidge is somebody we often see as a kind of a small government guy, you know, and so forth. But people quite properly called the establishment of the Federal Radio Commission probably one of the biggest federal efforts of regulation ever. And it probably was because what they did is they set up this commission. There were a lot of stations at the time that represented various perspectives, including labor unions, including kind of cranks, including the socialists, and they whittled them down. So the FCC basically went in and just said, okay, we're whittling down the stations. Now, the argument was, well, to re- you know, reduce frequency interference, but really it was a key part of this was We want to have a, we have a certain conception of what a radio station should look like, which is sort of a generic, you know, something that that came to happen. You know, they should look very similar, basically. Radio stations should, you know, uh, report the news, the weather. They should have generic programs that could be appealing to the entire community. And so they tended to weed out a lot of these more specialized stations. And so you get that happening. That happens under the Republicans. Now, what happens under Roosevelt is I think there's an implied threat there that some of these people are worried about, that you could get nationalization of of radio. Happened other places. So the networks, for a lot of reasons, and that was one of them, were extremely cooperative with the administration. They bent over backwards. Oh, you got a problem with this? You know, we'll correct it. So the big networks were basically pro-administration, did not buck the administration. The print newspapers were different. Roosevelt had overwhelming opposition from the print press. Radio, though, was very much under his control, basically. And radio executives deferred to him, constantly deferred to him. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting contrast. Now, of course, radio was increasingly becoming the way Americans got their news. And I think by the 1940s, there are far more radio stations than daily newspapers. So that that transition is occurring during this period. And, um, you know, and of course, Roosevelt has his familiar fireside chats, but also you add into the speeches, often airways given to him free, or at least you know, accommodated at any time. But then there also a lot of other people in the administration, and Louis Howe had his own radio show. All right. And there were just hours and hours of radio programs, thousands of hours produced by various New Deal agencies. So radio was really key to, and of course, Roosevelt had natural talent. It was said that he could have been a successful radio commentator. He would have been a top radio commentator if he had not been a politician. He had the voice for it. Uh, no, no president has more been more effective at using that medium than Roosevelt, and um, um, he had a certain point of view, and his his style, his charisma, was very well suited to sell in that point of view. Well, and you even wrote in your book that quote. No president in American history depended more on radio for the success of his administration than Franklin D. Roosevelt. And it was interesting because then later on, this idea kind of took a turn when you noted that, quote, Roosevelt had few, if any, scruples about hatching schemes to covertly sideline or even quash dissenting radio voices. He was the master of behind the scenes intrigue, usually via private sector or governmental intermediaries. So how did you see this playing out in practice during his administration? Well, you have to make a distinction between the networks, which are very pro-administration, and there are two of them. There end up being three of them by the end. But then there are a lot of these independent smaller stations. Where are you going to get more criticism of the administration? But networks absolutely dominate the airwaves, right, in terms of listenership and so forth. Okay, now, example of of the behind the scenes, I guess you could say was a, a, a guy that's now forgotten now, but he rivaled Lowell Thomas. He was one of the top radio commentators. His name was um, was Boke Carter. And uh, Carter was initially supportive of Roosevelt. 
He had supported him in the 1936 election, for example. But by 37, 38, he has increasingly become critical of the administration. And Roosevelt's complaining about this. And he's telling people privately, one guy, um, I forget what his name was, who wrote about the administration was a big Roosevelt supporter, said he was appalled by this. He couldn't believe it. And Roosevelt said, we're looking into this guy's background. We're looking into his citizenship because he was from Canada. I think he was from Canada. And we're looking into all these uh, his taxes and we want to get him off the air. And there was a big effort made and it was behind the scenes and it involved uh, a, a gentleman, you may have heard him named Joseph Davies. Davies was the ambassador to the Soviet Union, very controversial figure. But his wife was a Marjorie Merriweather Post of the Post, you know, Fortune. And uh, so she was on the board of uh, one of the sponsors of the uh, Carter's program. And they basically put pressure on him and said, look, you need to tone it down. And he agreed. Then he, then he violated the agreement. And eventually he, he ended up leaving the air. And, you know, he was, he was replaced. He was really the last, Carter was really the last significant anti-New Deal commentator, anti-Roosevelt commentator on the networks. And uh, there's, this is a fascinating correspondence on this which you can find in various sources. You piece it together. And I think in the Davies papers, including some other papers, you can find all these machinations that are going back and forth. So that would be an example uh, of that. It's harder to find uh, the paperwork, but I think a similar process probably occurred with Hugh Johnson. Hugh Johnson, many people know, was the first head of the National Recovery Administration. Less well-known is that Johnson turned against the administration pretty strongly by 37, 38, and he uh, uh, became a, 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 a radio commentator on several days a week. I think it was on NBC. And he, too, was the same year, was fired from now, even though he had very good ratings and so forth. So there really isn't anti-administration voices on network radio. You can find them a little bit more on the smaller stations and the smaller kind of regional networks that are out there. Well, and it's interesting, and that's something that seems to come up quite a bit in your book, that you had these folks who were supporters of the administration and who for some reason or another end up turning against and becoming vocal critics of the administration. And it seems like that second term was one of those key points for folks doing that. Very good point. And another one I'd point to that he, he uh, you know, he, he went through a long transition. So he had a lot of interesting things to say about Roosevelt's attitudes became increasingly critical as Raymond Moley. Um, Moley was the top guy there in the administration early on and and in the second term uh, turned against Roosevelt. Hugh Johnson is another example. So you're getting these people that are becoming Garner to some extent that are becoming increasingly critical of the administration um, who think the administration has gone too far. And a lot of that is manifested really in the second term. A lot of them sort of stuck with him through the 36th election. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. And, and there are a few themes that keep coming back in your book. And one of them, um, you discuss how the Roosevelt administration's surveillance and censorship efforts put them at odds with the civil rights movement. David, would you mind sharing with the audience some examples of this? Well, I mean, well, fairly well known was Roosevelt's failure to really back, to really back a, an anti-lynching bill. Uh, even though at one point Garner even said, gee, we need to do something about this. There was a real outrage about lynching and, and the administration really held back, uh, pushing that very effectively. So you could point to that. But the case I look at, and I guess you could say it's a civil rights case, involved a very interesting gentleman named J.B. Martin. Martin was an African-American Republican leader in Memphis. He was, in fact, the chair of the Republican Party for Shelby County. Now, 
that meant something because African Americans could actually vote in large numbers in Memphis through a very complicated deal that they had struck. Uh, African American leaders had struck with Boss Crump, the head of the Democratic machine in Memphis. And basically, they would often vote Republican. It was called the black and tan Republicans. But if Crump needed them in, in crucial kind of primaries or things like that, they would be they would help him. Well, there was a guy named J.B. Martin. Martin was an African-American Republican leader. He was also the head of the Negro Baseball League, the National League. He owned the local team, black team in Memphis, and he had built his family, a bunch of brothers, the Martin brothers, had built the stadium where they played. So he was, and he ran a drugstore that was quite prosperous, uh, you know, for African-Americans in in the region, um, South Memphis uh, 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 drugstore, which had its own postal substation. So it was kind of a big source of pride. But he becomes, I think it was in October, he becomes head of the Shelby County Party. And he immediately sets out to try to win the state for Wilkie. And you think, well, that sounds, you know, it's a southern state. But Tennessee had gone for Harding in 20. I think it had gone one more time in the 20s, maybe 28 for Hoover. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, it was a it was a playable state. Uh, you had this interesting alliance between the black and tans in Memphis and, uh, and other places, but mainly in Memphis and the white Republicans in, in uh, uh, you know, the more of the hill country and that kind of thing. So they would they kind of they would have to they would cooperate because they needed each other. And, you know, so it was it was a possibility. So he goes all out, says, I'm going to, you know, we're going to try to carry this state for Wilkie. And that would have just been incredible because Wilkie had a very strong civil rights record. He would have given them patronage. You know, Wilkie, you know, I think was a very strong believer in civil rights. And I think would have been quite aggressive. He was anti-political machine. He was anti-Crump. So Crump knew that, oh, we can't. I can't let this happen. So. Martin tried to organize and organized one of them successfully at over a thousand people, a multiracial rally in Shelby County. He was going to do another one. He was going all out. He got, you know, um, and, and what, and Crump passed the message down to Martin. You call off these rallies now and you shut down your headquarters and, uh, you, you stop this. And Martin said, I, you know, I can't. Martin had been all allied with Crump. But he said, no, I'm not. I'm going to go forward. And so the very next day after he held another rally, there were policemen outside of Martin's drugstore, the South Memphis drugstore, searching every customer who came in, white and black. And uh, they called it policing. So he had terms. They will police your drugstore. And that's what he did. And then it expanded to include other businesses that had supported the black and tans. Um, eventually, Martin was got in trouble because he had had a bonding agreement with the city that was sort of informal because he was an ally of Crump and Crump threatened basically to throw him in the workhouse. At that point, Martin left, left Memphis, but then he also complained to the Dar department of justice. And he said, this is blatant. I mean, cause it was, you read the newspapers, Crump is saying things. Well, he starts to engage in racism, which he didn't really do that much before, but he said, this is a white man's, country. Um, we don't want this kind of stuff that you see in Chicago happening here, you know, and he's just going all out to smash these black and tan people. And so it's blatant. It's about as blatant as civil liberties case. You could say civil rights case, but also civil liberties case, uh, because he's shutting down this guy's business openly for political reasons, right? So goes to the Justice Department, and there's a guy there, I forget his name now. Um, he had a German-sounding name, kind of a long one. But he was the head of the civil rights section in the Justice Department. And he was willing to prosecute. In fact, he was talking in some memos and stuff after he dep had a deposition for Martin. He said, okay, you know, if we move, we're going to move on. You know, it sounded like he was going to move. And nothing happened. The administration sent in someone to look over the situation who really didn't do anything. 
and there was no action taken and there was no prosecution. And Crump remained very much a close ally with the administration. Now, this is one of the more disappointing things because I've always thought Eleanor Roosevelt, and I still think she was a, you know, dedicated to civil rights and so forth. A. Philip Randolph, the famous labor leader, came to Memphis later to support Martin and then to promote in general free speech in Memphis. And he would, he would, they use the same things against him. They, they, uh, Crump went to the local black leaders and denied him speaker, speaker venues, strong armed them, did all sorts of things. And he complained to Eleanor Roosevelt. And, um, he said, could, could your, you know, we got to do something about this guy. Well, Crump was close to Roosevelt and he was also friendly with Eleanor. And she wrote him back after several weeks and said, I've been advised that we really should not look into this. <laughs> it's like, a one sentence letter. Oh, and uh, nothing happened. So it was, it was a, it was a, a lot of people say it's a state's rights issue and they were going to look at it. It really was a very good civil liberties issue. And the Justice Department had moved before with a lot less evidence. So I think you could have made a very good case here. And there were a lot of local whites in Memphis who, thought Crump was going too far. So he had a lot of criticism. He was not an overly popular figure outside of a certain constituency he had in Memphis because Crump could, was seen as the guy who could get stuff done, right? He could he could bring money in. He, he, he was efficient and so forth. Um, he was not mayor, though. He's an interesting case of a city boss who was not mayor. I mean, he was like for a few hours in 1940, and then he would have been mayor like 1914. But he, 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 he just, he ran the whole show and he, he gave marching orders to the mayor and to basically members of Congress. And he, he, he was a very, very interesting figure in that sense that he ran the machine. I think maybe partially the character in Mr. Smith goes to Washington was, was modeled after Crump, you know, this guy that doesn't hold office, but runs everything. Well, and it's just, it's so fascinating. And that's one of the things and I highly recommend for our listeners to read more. This was one of the portions of your book that was just fascinating to me, getting to understand some of the intricacies of this local political system and machine and how it had this connection with the administration. It really gives you insight into how machine politics worked at that time and the intricacies of racial politics in that. It was just, it was really fascinating. Yeah. Somebody told me about this in Memphis. He said, uh, he heard about my book and he said, you might want to be interested in this. I hadn't heard anything about it. And I said, my God. And he said, how can I bring this in as a chapter? It doesn't seem to be. And then I looked, and said, this is absolutely weaves in with the rest of the material. And it, so it, 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 it's been written about, but surprisingly little. And it's written written about by a lot of people that are looking at sort of Memphis history because it was key. Yeah. But it, the large implications of it, I had not seen much discussion of it beyond sort of looking, people looking at local history and maybe to some extent African-American history in Memphis, but not in a broader sense. Well, and then it's interesting, you know, in – the later portions of your book, you start to get into the war years. You know, you have the, you have Pearl Harbor, you have World War II, and what was going on then. And you noted that quote Roosevelt had long considered Japanese Americans to be a suspect group, even before the attack of Pearl Harbor, and that he even unsuccessfully pushed for the internment of folks in Hawaii. David, could you speak more to what you found in your research as to how his prejudices influenced his policymaking decisions during World War II? Well, I think he is he had been supportive of Uncle Ted's policy towards the Japanese. And 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 Ted, Theodore Roosevelt uh, uh certainly had a sort of uh, I guess you'd say a mixed record there. Um but he he one of the things he got was a kind of exclusion of Japanese immigrants as part of a deal, gentleman's agreement with the with the Japanese government. And Roosevelt, Ted Franklin Roosevelt, wrote about Japanese Americans in the 1920s. He these he wrote op eds. I think it was for the Warm Springs paper, right? There was the connection there. 
And he wrote, uh, basically, you call them op-eds. And in these op-eds, he said, look, California was right to uh, deny the, the, the right of Japanese Americans, uh, at least if they are not citizens, to own property in California. It is, uh, it, it, we should not allow intermarriage because of between Japanese Americans and whites because the children will whatever, not be up to snuff or whatever. So he expressed these kinds of attitudes. In the 30s, he, this is like 36, he said, look, if there's ever any attack coming, you know, from Japan, we need to search, uh, we need to, uh, not, not only, we need to um, uh, put Japanese, including Japanese Americans who have any connection who have visited, have any connection with the crew of these ships. It was very sweeping. We need to put them in concentration camp. Now, interestingly enough, Roosevelt used the term concentration camps. And some people criticize me. He says, well, these aren't concentration camps, because that's what I'm referring to. These are internment camps. He himself called them concentration camps. He called them that in 1944, for example, publicly. And By using that label, I don't want to be misunderstood as saying these are comparable to the death camps of the Nazis. They are not. They're a world apart from that. But they're not, to call them internment camps really softens them to a level that I don't think is justified. Because although we did intern German and Italian Americans, we did not do it wholesale on the base of ancestry, as we did with Japanese Americans. They're even putting orphans born in the United States of Japanese ancestry in camps, in the camps. So it is very much based on ancestry and it's wholesale. Now, not every Japanese is interned in the United States, though they're not in Hawaii. Roosevelt wanted to. Uh, They're not interned uh, uh, outside of the West Coast. But where most of them are, with the exception of Hawaii, they are. Uh, they are there's wholesale uh, there's wholesale internment um, or incarceration as some people are calling it now and and I use that label as well. But again, Roosevelt is is sort of predisposed in this direction. Now, it's often forgotten that after Pearl Harbor, uh, if you look at local newspapers, even in California, they're saying these are Americans, leave them alone. There's no groundswell of any significance to put the Japanese in internment camps. That does not happen till February. And it happens, I think, to a great extent because Roosevelt is very careful. He doesn't comment on this, but he gives breathing space to people, encouragement to people um, in the military, primarily, who are pushing for this and ends up signing off on it even though his own attorney general, this is, I surprise this isn't better, well, more better, well known. Uh, his attorney general, Francis Biddle, is against it. Jagger Hoover is against it. Uh, uh, Harold Icke, Secretary of the Interior, is against it. A lot of people are against it. So it's not like sometimes in textbooks you get the depiction of Roosevelt as sort of the hysteria of the moment he has to do it or whatever. Yeah, it's bad, but he, you know, it's sort of explained away, but there's so many people that are opposing it in the administration that I don't really think that that argument is persuasive. And I also think Roosevelt's a very persuasive guy. And other people are urging him to go on the air, defend the rights of the Japanese Americans as good Americans. That would have been the end of it. There had been hysteria. Um, but he doesn't do that. And he keeps them there. And even though 1944, going into the 44 campaign, a lot of people in the administration um, want him to release them, he doesn't do it. He doesn't release them. And that's after big battlefield victories and stuff. He doesn't do that until after the election. And he knows at that point um, that, you know, the Supreme Court's going to rule on it. So the rulings are kind of, which sustain internment, but the rulings are kind of moot because they know they're going to happen. And like right before them, I think it's right before them, they basically announce that they're going to empty out the camps and they emptied them all out by 46. But, uh, you know, so this occurred, this is going on for the whole war. 
Well, and it's interesting because you bring up the comparison to the Wilson administration during World War I, and you see some of the same things happening, but you also bring up the point that, quote, although Roosevelt generally faced more limits on his freedom of action than Wilson, his administration was the only one of the two to initiate a peacetime sedition case. So, David, would you mind elaborating more with us about this sedition case? Well, there were several sedition cases, and this was uh, one against these right-wingers who were connected with the um, Coughlin's group, Christian Front. And it was really kind of a bungled case by the government, and and, and I think this was right before Pearl Harbor, they are all they're acquitted. Um, but then there are, there's another pre-war case, and that is against the Socialist Workers' Party. That one is successful. And then there's a third case, and that is against these 32 defendants brought into Washington. It's called the Great Sedition Trial of 1944. And they're brought in from all over the country. And they would be someone, they tend to be right-wingers, and they would be include some guy that maybe has a newsletter in Kansas or something, and some other people. And these people don't even know each other by and large. And they're all scooped up and they're brought into Washington at the largest mass trial, I think, in the history of Washington, D.C. And they are um, they are accused of participating in a worldwide uh, conspiracy to uh, establish a Nazi government in the United States. And it just isn't there isn't a good case here. Right. Most of these people didn't even know each other. They had competing agendas. Um, they didn't really get along with each other. Although when the trial happened, they ended up all kind of getting along with each other. All these crazy people, and a lot of them are kind of looney tunes, who have their own lawyers in this small courtroom who are constantly objecting. The trial is very popular initially, but then people start turning it against it, including a lot of the lawyers who are like court-appointed lawyers, who are like New Deal lawyers. And uh, Washington Post, which had helped the trial get off the ground, really instrumental, turned against it and compared it to the Moscow purge trials. Um, so there's a lot of opposition, and it's kind of chaos with all these defendants and all these objections, and it drags on and on, and the judge is doesn't get control of the situation. He finally gets very frustrated, and he finally just drops dead. He dies, and probably because of all this pressure, and there was no end in sight. And at that point, they the government had a decision, do we appoint another judge? And they diddled and they dawdled, and they eventually just let it die. And then very soon after this case died, very really going, you know, at the same time, to some extent overlapping, we have under the new sedition trials being brought under the same law, the Smith Act, against the Communist Party. And that is ironic, of course, because the Communist Party had supported, very strongly supported, the sedition trial against the Great Sedition Trial of 44. By 45, 46, you got communists being prosecuted under the same law and who had supported the trial. So that's the typical pattern in American history, I guess you could say. And the right-wingers, a lot of them had support, supported the Smith Act, and they're prosecuted under the Smith Act. So you see this, it happens all the time, right? You know, your ox is being gored, and, you know, and your your attitude differs depending on that. Exactly. It's it's fascinating, and, and that's one of the things that I love about studying history is how you see these themes come up again. And it's like, one of these days, maybe people will learn, but no, it keeps happening. <laughs> well, I do see a lot of people, civil liberties consciousness on both sides. For example, a great tag team for civil liberties was Norman Thomas the Socialist Party candidate in 1936, and Alfred Landon, the Republican candidate. They got together and promoted civil liberties um, uh, after Thomas was literally expelled from Jersey City because he had a de- he was a, a demonstration criticizing, again, another machine leader, a Frank Haig, who was head of the political machine there, very similar figure to, to Crump. And he was literally for, uh, exiled from the city and Landon came in and very publicly supported him. And it's it's just so fascinating, the scope of so many of the things that you discussed in your book, the, the concentration camps for Japanese Americans, the sedition cases. And 
there are just so many fascinating figures that I learned about in your book that I'd like to research more. And one of those you mentioned earlier, Francis Biddle. Would you mind sharing with our audience more about Attorney General Francis Biddle and his role in the administration discussions about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, as well as the push to prosecute folks on sedition charges? Biddle is is your kind of stereotype of a of a kind of a well-meaning civil libertarian who's maybe not as ruthless as he could have been, right? Not as effective. But Biddle was a member, I think, of the American Civil Liberties Union. He had a good reputation. But he gets in. He's attorney general uh, during the war. And he goes back and forth. He, he initially says this is going to be different. Everybody's got civil liberties. We're, we're not going to be like World War One. But he's getting counter pressure, and that's directly from the president. So Biddle writes about this. Biddle's bi- biography is just an incredibly good source on this. And he says, at cabinet meetings, Roosevelt would just come to me, he'd stiffen up and said, when are you going to do, he'd do this publicly, kind of shaming Biddle at cabinet meetings, which is normally not what you do at cabinet meetings, and said, when are you going to prosecute the seditionists? When are you going to do it? And Biddle would try to hold him off. Roosevelt wanted to prosecute big names like uh, Robert McCormick, publisher of the Chicago Tribune, uh, Charles Lindbergh. He wanted to go after the big names, the big fish. And Biddle keeps coming back, says, we just don't have the evidence. We don't. He holds them off. And there's a lot of people like that. And then eventually we get these sedition trials of the Socialist Workers Party, which Biddle later said he regretted. But mainly the the one Roosevelt was mainly interested in was the great sedition trial of 44 against these sort of right wingers. But they tend to be kind of marginal right wingers. There was one kind of interesting exception, and that was a guy named William Griffin, who was the first publisher of what became the National Enquirer, New York Enquirer, kind of a big guy, big publisher. He is initially going to be prosecuted, but they don't. They end up dropping that. So they tend to be marginal types. But that is Biddle's way, the, bringing the sedition trial is the way of appeasing Roosevelt and also appeasing people on the left who want to prosecute big fish because a lot of them still have hope, well, these, these smaller fish will inform on the big fish and we'll get them eventually. That's sort of the view they have. They'll flip on them. And it doesn't really happen. And so. Um, Biddle is resisting that. Now, Biddle uh, uh, is also, as I said, he's against the Japanese internment, but he ends up going along with it, right? In the end, his two subordinates, who were very much against it, are appalled because there's this meeting where it's become clear that Roosevelt has decided we're going to go forward. And Biddle basically says, okay, you know, whatever you need, you know, I'll, we'll do, right? And they're appalled by this. So he, He's he's overawed by people like Stimson, who are in the cabinet, who he has great respect for, who he sees as elder statesmen. He's not going to take them on. So he's not a good political infighter, and he tends to be intimidated. But he's pretty strongly critical of doing this. But he, he ends up saying in the end, look, we're not going to. He didn't want any part of it, though. And so it ends up being the Army's affair. And that's partly because Biddle just didn't want his, he didn't want any part of it, but he ends up going along with it. So that's, you know, the Department of Justice stays out of it for the most part and lets the Army do the whole thing. Well, and it was interesting because you, I remember you wrote that, you know, with some of the arguments, Biddle was like, well, I'm the new kid on the block. I just became attorney general. Should I really get involved? And especially like with the internment of Japanese Americans that, He did actually voice his objections, but by that point, the decision had pretty much been reached. And so, you know, it it just kind of shrugs his head and, okay, well, what what can we do? And, of course, he could have done, he could have protested more. I think if he'd have been more vigorous and he had an ally, and this is often forgotten, potential ally, and that's Jagger Hoover. Now, Hoover is, you know, hard to, you know, you don't want to necessarily rely on him, but Hoover didn't like the internment. He didn't think it was necessary. And he even made some arguments about, you know, this is not America and all that. But I think his main thing was he didn't want anything to do with this, right? 
uh, he saw that this is just problems. So you could have had a Biddle, you could have uh, had others, including in the military. You could have a pretty effective coalition that Biddle could have used to pressure Roosevelt. And Roosevelt is somebody that does see the political bottom line. Now, Roosevelt, though, on internment, wanted to intern the Japanese Americans in Hawaii. And he wanted to confine them to one of the smaller islands. But then it started to be pointed out, that's going to be a lot of money. We're going to have to divert ships from the front lines to transport them. But the main thing that stopped it was an example that Biddle could have benefited from or could have learned from. And that was the, the military commander in Hawaii. He was against it. Now, he didn't sort of make a brave stand, but he used bureaucratic delay. He used, he used various methods to, Al Emmons, I think was his name, to, to frustrate it, and it didn't happen in Hawaii. But Roosevelt is committed to that. Even after he issues the executive order, famous executive order, he's like saying, we need to do this. Um, but the logistics were just enormous because you're talking about one third of the population of Hawaii. I mean, this would have been very, very difficult. But the arguments for it were much stronger than the West Coast. After all, this is where Pearl Harbor was. And, you know, even though you don't really see any good examples of the Japanese Americans, but they're there on the front line. And, you know, they don't do it. They don't do it. Well, and again, to the listeners, I highly recommend reading David's book because there is so much more insight and perspective into these challenging and fascinating points of the FDR administration than we've really got time to go into today. And, and it's just it's just so fascinating. There's so much there's so much there and, you know, and it was just, it was a fascinating read and I've got so many notes now and Biddle's autobiography is one of those that I'd like to read just moving forward to, to learn more about. But David, as we draw close to the end of our conversation, you had alluded to this earlier, but what was the most surprising insight that you found in the course of your research? And what do you see as the key takeaway for your audience from your work? All right. Well, I mean, I mentioned the, the whole Black Committee. I could, could sort of elaborate on that. The extent of the surveillance, 3 million telegrams. I also think the whole Memphis interlude was quite ended up drawing me in, and it was something that was surprising. Um, this guy, J.B. Mart, who who was this in- accomplished leader, businessman, who, uh, you know, t- tried to build this political coalition in 1940 and was put down quite effectively and got no support. So that whole Memphis thing, I find the the dynamics there, the political dynamics there, the unique nature of this place where you have black voters and, and, you know, in the South and so forth. I found that quite fascinating. What is the takeaway? Well, I think that, I think it would be that we haven't looked enough at Roosevelt's civil liberties record. And that if we look at it closely, I would make the argument that, he has actually got a weaker civil liberties record than Woodrow Wilson, who he served under, and I think imbibed a lot of what Wilson was doing. But why do we not regard why do we regard Roosevelt as as having a better civil liberties record? Well, first of all, this is the guy that gave us the four freedom speech, right? So there you have this flowery rhetoric, which came late, late in his administration. I think it was a response to a lot of things going on including the international situation. But what we also see is that although I think Roosevelt's instincts were in a lot of ways worse than Wilson's, he had more resistance on a lot of issues. Yes, we had the Japanese internment, but you had a lot of people in the administration like Biddle who were pushing back on things like sedition trials. You had a lot of obstacles. So I think that there was a civil liberties consciousness which had reached the Justice Department, which had permeated much of American society that was not there in World War I. And it was because of World War I. A lot of people said, we don't want to do that again. That was 
a view that was had, and that also a lot of people look back at prohibition and all the violations of civil liberties. So there is a counter movement that I think prevents the president from doing some things he wanted to do, like prosecute leading uh, big names who had opposed his foreign policy. Now, what happens at Pearl Harbor, this is end with this, is opposition to the war evaporates. So that's a different dynamic. In World War I, there was still a lot of people who did not want to go to war after, uh, you know, during the war. But in 41, just about all these people, including many of the sedition trial defendants, said, we're with, you know, we're with the government now. We've been attacked. We've got to respond to that. So there isn't as much opposition to the war. That's perhaps another reason as well. As I say, you have nets. You're trying to catch people for trials. There are fewer people to catch because, yeah, they opposed him pre-war, but once the war starts, they at least give lip service to supporting the administration. And for our listeners, this conversation, I hope, has shown you that there is a fresh take to the history of the FDR administration to be found in the New Deal's war on the Bill of Rights, the untold story of FDR's concentration camps, censorship, and mass surveillance. David, I cannot thank you enough for your insight and your time today and for this amazing book. Like I said, I've got so many points that I want to research even more after reading this. It's it's definitely got me interested more in this period in presidential history. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I appreciate your careful preparation and the, the questions, which I think were very much on point. And listeners, thank you so much for being here. And please get to reading. Thanks so much again to David T. Beto for coming on the Presidency's podcast and sharing the insight that he gained about FDR's presidency during the course of his research for his recently released work, The New Deal's War on the Bill of Rights, the untold story of FDR's concentration camps, censorship, and mass surveillance. I'll have a link to the publisher's website for the book on the page for this episode on my website, Presidency's Podcast, that's all one word, dot com. There. You can also find past episodes of the podcast, links to more information about all of the presidents, and information about how you, yes, you, dear listener, can help to support the work of the Presidency's podcast. Whether it's through leaving a rating and review, fulfilling one of the requests for books for research for the podcast, or by becoming a patron by going to patreon.com slash presidencies, however you help to promote the work of this podcast, you have my sincerest thanks. This podcast has been a labor of love for nearly seven years now, and it could not have been sustained this long without so many supportive listeners, fellow podcasters, and loved ones. Thank you, one and all. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can send me an email at presidenciespodcast, that's all one word, at gmail.com. You can also follow me on social media if you don't already. I'm available on Facebook, Blue Sky, Mastodon, and Post as Presidencies, on the formerly known as Twitter at Presidencies89, and on Instagram at Threads at Presidencies Podcast. Last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Until next time, stay safe and healthy, be kind to one another, and take care, dear friends. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place. The sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work, and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at twodesignerswalkintoabar.com and listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com.